there are many oxides of nitrogen and it's quite easy, frankly, to get the oxides of nitrogen confused, especially when you're naming the oxides of nitrogen. So if we look very briefly at this table, this is nitrogen in oxidation state plus one, if we're counting up. This what compound here is nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is N2O. This compound is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is nitrogen in oxidation state plus two, and it has one oxygen in it. So NO is nitric oxide. <coughs> this compound here is a plus three oxidation state, at least formally, uh, as an average, it's a plus three oxidation state, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a moment. That would be ni dinitrogen trioxide. Nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen tetraoxide are nitrogen in oxidation state plus four, and this one, dinitrogen pentoxide, is nitrogen in oxidation state five. And if you assume an oxidation state of minus two for oxygen, then all of those should be readily apparent. Incidentally, all oxides of non-metal elements. All oxides of non-metal elements, if you treat them with water, then what you get are the acids. And so these oxides of non-metal elements are known as the anhydrides of the respective acid. So this nitrous oxide here is the anhydride of hyponitrous acid. What a wonderful name. N2O2 is the anhydride of nitrous acid, not to be confused with the one that you are familiar with, and that is nitric acid. Nitric acid is nitrogen in oxidation state plus five, nitrous oxide. How do we make nitrous oxide? Well, nitrous oxide is made through a comproportionation reaction. A comproportionation reaction is a reaction where you have two species of the same element in different oxidation states. So we have an example of that here. We have ammonia, where nitrogen is in oxidation state minus three. Okay, and we have nitrate, where nitrogen is in oxidation state plus five. And if you think of that, you have minus three and plus five. What is the average of minus three and plus five? It's plus one. And if you heat ammonium nitrate, it decomposes and it gives you nitrous oxide and water. And nitrous oxide has nitrogen in the oxidation state of plus one. So here's our definition. A comproportionation reaction is a redox reaction, a reduction oxidation reaction, where the same element is both the reductant and the oxidant. Now, the opposite, if you will, of a comproportionation reaction is a disproportionation reaction. To take this reaction in reverse, just for example, if you started off with nitrous oxide and you went to ammonium nitrate, then that would be a disproportionation reaction because you start with an element in one oxidation state and you go to a situation where the element is in two oxidation states. And we'll see real examples of this in chlorine chemistry later in the lecture course. Right, nitrous oxide. Well, I trust you could all draw Lewis structures for nitrous oxide. In fact, you could all draw several Lewis structures for nitrous oxide. And indeed, after having Lewis structures in organic chemistry as well, you would <coughs> probably be prepared to represent your dative resonance forms in more than one fashion. So this is the sort of way that I would typically draw these two molecules. I would draw a form where we have a triple bond between the two nitrogens and a dative bond to the oxygen, which is managing to attain an octet of electrons on all of these elements. There's another way of doing this. We can have a double bond, a proper double bond to the oxygen, and we can have a single bond to the nitrogen and then a dative interaction, which will give us again an octet of electrons on both of these elements. And of course, if we actually look at the bond lengths here, you can see that there is a difference in the bond lengths in a molecule of nitrous oxide. Those two bonds are not the same length, but this bond is not as short 
as you would expect it to be if it was a triple bond. Remember, the stronger the bond, the shorter it is. So what we've probably got in this system is a mixture of those two resonance forms. Lewis structures are not going to tell us which of these resonance forms is the most favourable. This blue diagram here is simply another way of representing the middle structure. So remember, if you're drawing a dative bond, I like to put arrows here, meaning that the two electrons have come from this nitrogen. Organic chemists tend to think of this as an ionisation process where the nitrogen is giving up an electron to the other nitrogen, forming a positive charge on this nitrogen and a negative charge on here. But these are two ways of saying exactly the same thing. Now, if you look at this, dinitrogen oxide, that ought to be a good oxidising agent because it should be possible for it to just give up its oxygen and form dinitrogen, which as we well know is a very stable molecule. So thermodynamically speaking, this should be a very good oxidising agent. But as a matter of fact, it's not. It's actually a kinetically very inert molecule. So thermodynamically, this should be a good oxidising agent. In practice, the kinetics are such, the strength of the bonds are such, that it doesn't react in that fashion. Laughing gas is used, still used as an anaesthetic in labour. Now, what chemistry can we do with it? Well, nitrous oxide can be used or to oxidise the amide anion, NH2-, minus, what you get by deprotonating ammonia, and that will give you the azide anion. Azides are linear molecules, and they're isoelectronic to CO2. So you can draw these things in this fashion using arrows to represent dative bonds or in this fashion representing the, again essentially a dative bond where we're formally ionizing the species here. These are isoelectronic species to CO2. We all know the structure of CO2. It is a linear molecule with carbon oxygen double bonds. So it's not surprising to you that the linear that the azide anion, which is isoelectronic to CO2, also has this linear structure with double bonds. It's a very strong base. And because it's a very strong base, it forms a very weak acid. So hydroazoic acid, you won't encounter very often, is a weak acid of comparable acidity to acetic acid. Why? Because this is quite a basic anion. And once the proton is stuck on it, it doesn't come off very readily. What are these things good for? Well, actually, these things are, if you have the right cation, they're pretty stable. So sodium azide, remember we talked about the stability of lattices. If you have a good match between the cation and the anion, you can have a fairly stable lattice. So sodium azide is fairly stable. However, if you use a large heavy metal ion, then you produce an azide that is no longer thermally stable. So these metal azides, for example, mercury azide, is often used as the detonator in explosives. So what you have is a very sensitive compound that decomposes very readily in explosive fashion such that it can set off a larger charge. So mercury azide is used often as the detonator in explosive systems. It would be expensive and messy to have large amounts of, um, of mercury azide as the actual explosive, but it's very good at setting off a larger charge in these systems. Also, if you have one of these, of course, when it decomposes, and the reason it's explosive is it liberates large quantities of nitrogen. So if you have a compound that can decompose to give off large quantities of a gas, that can be quite useful. And one application it can be quite useful for is actually in a car safety airbag. What you need to be able to do in an airbag is to fill it with gas very, very quickly on demand. And the way that that's actually done is by decomposing metal azides, giving off lots of nitrogen, filling your cushion bag and protecting you during a car crash. Nitrogen oxidation state two, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a colourless gas. This can lead to a little bit of confusion, as we'll see in a moment. Nitric oxide is actually a colourless gas. And nitric oxide is the byproduct in lots of nitration reactions. When you dissolve metals in nitric acid, you get nitric oxide formally being formed in your equations. 
but then you see, as we'll see later, you get lots of brown gas evolved. The brown gas we'll come to in a moment, but the brown gas is not nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a colourless gas. Nitric oxide is going to be a radical. Now, one of the points that I would make here is that nitrogen has five valence electrons and oxygen has six valence electrons. Add those two numbers together and you get 11. That is an odd number of electrons. Whenever you have an odd number of electrons in your compound, your compound is inevitably always going to be a radical. And what you know about radicals today is that radicals are very reactive species which to a large extent is true, but some of these nitrogen-oxygen compounds are amongst the most stable radicals known to man. So yes, they are radicals, yes, they are reactive, but they don't always dimerize or do some of the chemistry that you would normally associate with radical species. So we will, in, or we have, we're going to encounter many examples of radical species in this nitrogen-oxygen chemistry. How do we make nitric uh, oxide? Well, you can make nitric oxide by the oxidation of ammonia. And we, once we get into ammonia chemistry, all sorts of things become possible. So ammonia plus oxygen goes to nitric oxide and uh, water in these systems. You need a platinum rhodium catalyst for that process. It's a radical. And interestingly enough, for the biochemists, this is a very toxic molecule. Yet it is actually present in our cells. Nitric oxide has a number of important roles to play in biology, in particular as a signaling agent and in things like in um, uh, vascular dilation effects are caused by NO. With nitric oxide, essentially you have a compound that is a radical. Why is it a radical? Well, if you've, you're familiar with the molecular orbital diagram for carbon monoxide, if you go to nitric oxide, what you are doing is you are adding one more electron. So if you remember your molecular orbital diagram of carbon monoxide, you'll know where you're going to add that extra electron. You'll add that extra electron into a pi star orbital. And it won't then surprise you that it's a really quite a facile process to remove that extra electron from the high energy pi star orbital and in so doing make a triply bonded NO plus species which is isoelectronic to CO. So the chemistry of the NO cation is isoelectronic to carbon monoxide and NO is an oxide oxidation product of nitrogen and it's one of those nitrogen oxides that is produced by car engines. So car engines produce many oxides of nitrogen which are uh, pollutants. Nitric oxide is to put one of those. Now I said that if you do nitration chemistry then the byproduct, the primary byproduct, is frequently nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a colourless gas but when you do these reactions you get loads of brown fumes coming off. So what are these brown fumes? Well, the brown fumes are the product of the reaction between nitric oxide, NO, and oxygen. So obviously we need um, half an equivalent or two equivalents of nitric oxide to one of oxygen. And what we produce is nitrogen dioxide. So nitrogen dioxide, we're adding six electrons to 11 electrons. We still have an odd number of electrons. So Nitrogen dioxide is still a radical. This species is going to be a radical, and we know that that radical is going to help to predict the structure. If you remove that unpaired electron, you produce a cationic species, which is now isoelectronic to carbon dioxide. It is a radical, and what you'll be familiar with in radical chemistry is that radical species can dimerize to form covalent bonds. And that can happen in the case of nitrogen dioxide. So nitrogen dioxide can dimerize to form a bond in this fashion. So here we go, dinitrogen tetraoxide is what happens if you have two nitrogen dioxides and they fuse together to form a new structure. Now, if you take one molecule of nitric oxide and one molecule of nitrogen dioxide, then you can also, these are both radicals, remember? these can also come together to form a new molecule. And that new molecule will be dinitrogen trioxide. And you can imagine how difficult it is to get, make sure you get all these names right. So this is dinitrogen trioxide. 
uh, any element-element bond is going to have what we call an oxidation number of zero, just like in dinitrogen. So we don't have any contribution to the oxidation state from the nitrogen-nitrogen bond. We have an oxygen here that has an oxidation state of minus two. So this nitrogen here is in oxidation state plus two. This oxygen, this, sorry, this nitrogen here is bonded to two oxygens, so this nitrogen is in oxidation state plus four. So this molecule here actually has an average nitrogen oxidation state of plus three, and this can be dissolved in water, and if you dissolve it in water, what you produce is nitrous acid. Very careful with the name. Nitrous acid is the proton salt of the NO2 minus anion, not the NO3 minus anion, which is nitric acid and will give us nitric acid. And these form salts which are called not nitrates, but nitrites. So these are nitrite salts.